So what do we mean then by equity finance? Uh, let me explain exactly what equity finance is. Extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. So do not be fooled into thinking that a five minute YouTube video can explain how to do it. Do not be fooled into thinking that somebody with a, a Californian accent talking about what happened in Silicon Valley is how it happens in real life. It is not. Firstly, Silicon Valley is very special. It's a unique situation. And secondly, equity finance is extremely difficult in any country. What it really involves is you raising cash for a business by selling shares. Now that means immediately you can only do this with a private limited company because only a private limited company can issue new shares. If those shares are then bought by a third party, let's say they buy 25% of the shares, then the new party owns 25% of the company. And the money that's paid goes into the bank account of the company, not into the original owners or founders. So why do people buy shares? For two reasons. Firstly, if it's a new company, they want to buy the shares at a low price and then sell them in a few years time for a higher price. And that's called the exit strategy, the exit. So the entry point is buying the shares, the exit is when they sell those shares. So that happens possibly up to five years later. Sometimes people buy shares in pre-existing successful companies traded on a public stock exchange, and those are called public companies. And that's very different from what we're talking about here. People buy shares in those companies and they would expect to have a percentage of profits proportional to the percentage of shares that they owe every year. For a new company, we don't issue profits as a share to owners. We're using that money to grow the company, to build it up rapidly, and then ultimately to sell it. Because the money that we're making, if we're making profit, is much better used by building the company so we sell it for a lot more later and make a higher capital gain. Everything here goes back to the shape of finance that I've shown you. Raising equity finance is very important and vital when you need a lot of money and for quite a long period of time, you won't be able to repay a loan. So bank finance is impossible and equity finance is your only way to go. And sometimes it has to be raised in multiple rounds. So nobody would ever raise all the money they need at the beginning. You raise a certain amount of money at the beginning when your share price is low, you have to make progress. So your share price goes up then you issue new shares, raise more money, and so on. So you do it step by step. Why do they buy shares? Quite simply, to make a capital gain. The investor wants to buy shares now and sell them at a later date for a higher share price. In order to do that, you've got to persuade them of two things. That the company has the potential to grow very rapidly. And secondly, that you as a management team have the ability to facilitate that growth. Are investors interested in the technology? No, couldn't care less. They're looking at your potential as a business and they're looking at your ability as a management team to take the business forward and make the company worth, you know, maybe 10 times more than it is today in a few years time. So perception is all that we have to be thinking about here. And to actually make sure that you meet their expectations, you've got to match that perception with progress. So this is why we need to make progress as we go along. So potential, 
perception, progress, all very important. Does it have anything to do with your end of year accounting figures? Absolutely nothing. If you're not generating revenue every year, your accountant will say quite correctly that in accounting terms, you've made a loss. But your share price might be going up in the eyes of investors because perhaps you have developed a new strain of organic vegetable that you can grow and dominate a European market. Fantastic. Or you filed a patent for a drug that looks promising in the clinic in some type of cancer. Fantastic. Have you made any money? No. Have you spent a lot of money more than is coming in? Yes. What do accountants call that? A loss. What do investors call that? Great progress. Well done. So please, you need to be thinking about things differently. Everything that's important relates to progress and the perception of that progress. So very, very important that you persuade investors about the progress you're making. <coughs> what do they look at? Well, if you're a trading business, then of course, the profit and loss and balance sheet are important, but we're not talking about trading businesses. We're talking about new business. Somebody wants to start up a new entity, particularly spin-outs, or they're not very often called spin-offs, but spin-out companies, new companies from a university setting. But all businesses are the same. They only sell one thing. Only sell one thing. Every business only sells one thing. It's called know-how. And that know-how is packaged in one of two ways. Only a product or a service. There's nothing else. So all businesses sell know-how and they package that in one of two ways or sometimes both. A restaurant sells a product and a service, for example. So a university spin-out based upon the most incredible research that's been undertaken over a 10-year period by world experts is still only selling know-how. Somebody who's been working in the fields doing real work, toiling with their hands, growing a strain of vegetable, which is resistant to a particular type of disease. The know-how is how they've done that, how they've achieved that. It's still know-how and they're still selling a product or a service. So this idea of know-how, product and service, you've got to be very clear about what it is because you've got to protect that know-how and you're not looking at what accountants think, you're looking at what real people think. So what real progress have I made? What steps forward have we taken? Is the company now worth more? Have we made enough progress to say we're in a better position now than we were before we spent the money? So these are the things you've got to be thinking about all the time and that's what investors look for. So what is the most important? The management team. Again, my sincere apologies to those of you who are you know, learned research scientists. I know you believe in your research work. I know how important it is to you, but I'm explaining how important it is to financiers. And the answer is they couldn't care less. They will be polite and they'll say it's very exciting and very interesting and marvelous. But what they're really interested in, can this management team fulfill the opportunity created by the technology, by the research, and so they're looking at the business. And if they're buying shares, they're buying into the business. They're not buying into the technology. They're buying into the business. So don't be offended by the attitude of financiers. You've got to make it very easy for them to understand what the technology is all about and what it does. But it's the business that they're interested in buying into, not the technology. If it was the technology, you'd be applying for a research grant but you're not. You're applying for business funding and that's not the same thing as a research grant. When you sell shares in a company, the most common way of doing that is selling ordinary shares and those all have the same weighting. So anybody who has one ordinary share has the same 
um, you know, authority, decision-making ability as somebody else with one ordinary share. There can be different share classes which have greater authority. At the beginning, try to avoid that. They're often insisted upon by what's called venture capital companies. Those are large organizations that will be investing 5 million, 20 million. I suspect few people listening to this talk are looking to find five to 20 million. So let's not worry too much about that, but be aware that those large organizations are very difficult to deal with. And they have so many people applying for funding from them. They're able to turn down well over 95% of applications and probably only 2% get the money. So unless you agree to their terms, it's very unlikely you'll get their money. So let's not worry about those, but focus more in terms of equity finance on working with individuals, the business angels. Now, we've seen quite a lot happen in Malta, which is entirely inappropriate. Um, we've seen it in a number of settings, uh, but quite often, in an area where uh, it's not a mature discipline. Uh, so in regions where equity finance is not a particularly mature way forward, um, wealthy people will say, okay, I will put in a hundred thousand into your company. That's my investment. And I will take 50% of your company and you will repay me that money at 9% interest per year over three years. That's neither a loan nor is it equity finance, it's called stealing. And such people should not be allowed to get away with that. Let's move to the reality of what should happen. Whenever you sell shares in your company, you set the price of those shares and people either pay that amount or not. Just when you go and buy a pizza from the takeaway shop and you say, how much is the margarita pizza? and they say six euros 80, you either pay it or you don't. It's not a discussion or a negotiation. So there are some different ways of thinking about this, but you know, you're gonna buy the entire pizza, but this is about buying a slice of the pizza. And so that being the case, there will be more than one person owning a portion of the company. And so if one group has more than 50%, they're referred to as the simple majority, and they're allowed to make all the decisions because they've got more than 50% ownership. Unless there is an agreement between the shareholders that protects those who have less shareholding. And so a shareholder agreement is very important and you should talk to a corporate lawyer about this. And they cover such things as ownership, voting rights, control and management. And they protect the company from competing interests. So if 10 of us owned a company, I can't go and sell my shares to a competitor because that would not be in the best interest of the other members of the company. So if you're thinking of raising equity finance, you must have a shareholder agreement. I do not want to explain exactly what it contains because I do not want to turn you into a lawyer. What I want to tell you is you must have a lawyer do this. This is not DIY. This is not a five minute YouTube. This is something where an expert with experience has to do it for you. So one of the good things about this is this section on dispute resolution. Uh, you can include rules about what will happen if something, you know, arises, how do we get to a decision? And one of the things that does happen is that somebody comes along making an offer for the shares of the company to buy the company. And quite a lot of people say, I'm prepared to sell, quite a lot of the owners. And one or two of the owners say, I'm not prepared to sell. And so we have two common things in this agreement, which are referred to as tag along or drag along. All it means is if enough of the owners are in agreement, we can make everybody else sell because we force, we drag them along to that. 
Or is if somebody else gets a good offer on the share price, then the rest of us can tag along. All of these things you don't need to worry about. Be aware that you mustn't make decisions unless a suitable number of people agree. Otherwise, it's just who has more than 50% owns the company and runs the company. So do investigate shareholder agreements if you intend to raise equity finance.